Good evening from Toronto. Good morning and good afternoon to all those who are joining us from across the world. Welcome to Lessons from Nagasaki. I'm Kehka Shabasu. I am the founder president of Green Hope Foundation and a member of Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons. And I will be your moderator for this webinar. Now today we have gathered here to discuss a topic that is very close to our hearts, the thought of which gives us sleepless nights. Nagasaki cannot be an afterthought. As sadly, the annihilation of Nagasaki is often overshadowed by the devastation that was wrought upon Hiroshima. The decision to drop Batman, the plutonium implosion bomb on the city of Nagasaki by people sitting far, far away, signed the death warrant for a city of 240,000 people and for their future generations. It was a catastrophic blast on that fateful day of August 9th, 1945 at 11.02, the death machine that was dropped on Nagasaki at 11.02 a.m it caused a catastrophic blast that was 40% more powerful than Hiroshima that vaporized thousands within the first 40 seconds, unleashing horizontal blast winds that tore through the region at two and a half times the speed of a category five hurricane, pulverizing buildings, un uh, killing tr uh, with trees, animals, vegetation, and thousands of people. And that blazing heat twisted iron, it disintegrated vegetation, inclined clothing, and melted human skin. And fires broke out across the city, burning thousands of civilians alive. And while the Hiroshima blast was no less horrific, it is the utter senselessness of a second blast on an already reeling nation that makes it a greater tragedy. What lessons should we learn from Nagasaki? Why did it have to happen at all? Despite causing greater destruction, why is it not recalled and recounted in greater detail to this day? Today's discussion, Lessons from Nagasaki, is a comprehensive dialogue, a call to action, and a meeting in solidarity with a tragedy that could so easily have been avoided. On that note, I would like to invite our first panelist, Ambassador Thomas Graham, former special representative for President Clinton for disarmament, chairman of Lightbridge Corporation, and member of Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons. Ambassador Graham, you have the floor. Ambassador Graham, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. I'll start again. Uh, uh, thank you, Kekashan, and uh, uh, good evening, good morning, good day to uh, where to everyone, wherever you may be. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Nagasaki and what an uncertain thing it was. Uh, to begin with, um, it, uh, uh, it, it it was on the original list of cities that might receive a atomic bomb, uh, but it was taken off that list when that list was shrinked to 11. Uh, and then the night before, the day before, it was to be, uh, the, the mission was to take place against the primary target, it was scratched in with a pen. No one really knows why. And because there was a backup, uh, a backup target that they already had. And for some reason, uh, Nagasaki, which some people have called the San Francisco of Japan, uh, was, was added. And then second, uh, the bomb, uh, the technician doing the last check on the bomb uh, found the, the arming uh, 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 wire was put in backwards. Normally that takes a week to fix, would, would take it past the surrender of the, of the Japanese uh, government but he decided to fix it on the spot with some danger and succeeded. Then third, the previous four planes that had taken off that night of uh, the night of the eighth um, uh, had uh, 
had crashed. And, and so here was uh, the, the same B-20, same type of B-29 taking off from uh, the airfield on the island of Tinian. And it had a five ton projectile inside and everyone was just holding their breath as to whether it would make it out of the, uh, over the end of the runway. And it did, bar barely. And then uh, it had to fly through six hours of uh, electrical storms to finally reach the, uh, uh, the uh, point where it was to meet two other B-29s and, and then um, go after the, the uh, pr principal target, which was the Kokura Arsenal near uh, Yokohama. And um, it turned out that one of the two uh, planes it was to meet got lost and never showed up. Uh, the other one did. And uh, so the two planes approached uh, Koku uh, Kokura Arsenal uh, in the town of Kokura. And, uh, and they looked ahead uh, and they saw that the target was completely obscured by smoke, uh, by haze, and by uh, some substances looked like steam, perhaps. And um, of course, there's many people, many speculations as to why that was so, whether it was weather, uh, the US had firebombed the city very nearby the day before. It could have been smoke from that firebombing, uh, which would have been ironic. And, and um, uh, or the Japanese uh, technicians claimed years later that they released the steam from all their uh, electrical uh, um, uh, power generators and, and created a lot of steam around, the, uh, around Kokura. Now, which, whichever you believe, uh, they, the pilots couldn't see the target and they were under instructions to uh, actually see the target before they uh, uh, before they uh, delivered uh, one of these bombs um, uh, because it was supposed to be as accurate as they could make it and they could, there's no way they could see Kokura and en route to Kokura another technical thing happened the um, reserve fuel tank of the plane shut down and cut, cut off about 50% of their fuel. So they had much less fuel to deal with. And after 45 minutes circling, circling around Kokura and not finding anything to uh, anything open, then uh, they uh, decided to, uh, as their fuel was running low, to make a run down to Nagasaki. And, um, and by the time, they, which was, took about 30, 40 minutes, and, and by the time they got to Nagasaki, uh, A, uh, they were getting really low on fuel and uh, realized they couldn't even make it back to their airfield. They'd have to go to an alternate site. And B, it was covered by clouds too. And so they only had enough fuel for one pass around, um, around uh, uh, Nagasaki. And uh, the, the bombardier during that pass shouted into his microphone, I got it, I got it. Now nobody knows really what he got, uh, even to this day. Uh, but most people suspect he didn't see anything, but he just read it on his radar because the pilots, the crew, did not want to dump the bomb in the Pacific Ocean since it cost a billion dollars to make and that wouldn't have reflected well on them. So, uh, so the control of the bomb was turned over to the bombardier and he, uh, about 30 seconds after he had taken control, he claims he saw a hole in the clouds in which he could see a couple of radar uh, uh, radar railroad tracks, uh, and that's recorded in the official history that he did see this hole in the clouds, but all he could see were railroad tracks. So he dropped the bomb into that hole. Uh, now the principle, the reason that that Nagasaki was on this list at all, 
was because it was um, uh, the Mitsubishi torpedo factory was there. It was not a big military city, but the torpedo factory was was there, and uh, and that's what they were going after. But they they didn't really know whether they would be successful in bombing it or not because they didn't know exactly where the bomb was going. And it turns out that the torpedo factory was very near the Ukami uh, Cathedral, Urakami Cathedral, which was the largest uh, cathedral in Asia, a Christian cathedral, Catholic cathedral, and the only one in Japan. And uh, uh, Nagasaki has an interesting history in that it's, um, um, uh, when the Tokugawa shogunate took over in 1600, they uh, isolated Japan from all foreign contacts, except for one port, Nagasaki. And there had been a lot of Christians there and they were forced to convert. And a few Christians, a small Christian community was allowed to uh, live in Nagasaki, but nowhere else. And they were still there and they had built this cathedral. So in addition to the torpedo factory, this cathedral was utterly destroyed and church, church schools nearby were destroyed. And, and uh, it, it just was uh, a confused operation from start to finish. The uh, uh, plane flew back to uh, Okinawa, it couldn't make it as far as Tinian. And as it landed in Okinawa, just as it touched down, uh, all the engines cut off and because the fuel uh, had was used up and that's how close it was and and uh, the next day when President Truman got the full story about Hiroshima and Nagasaki because you know, the information came out slowly <clears throat> he ordered a stop to all further nuclear weapon bombings and that wasn't a light thing to do because there was another one on the way. That's the story of Nagasaki. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that uh, with us. I'm sure many in our audience were unaware of the information that you shared today, specifically that uh, the primary target was the city of Kokura that housed the in infamous Kokura arsenal, the massive collection of Japan's war industries, and that you know, overcast conditions and low fuel forced that B-29 bomber to turn back and in a cruel twist of fate, drop Batman, the plutonium bomb on Nagasaki and devastating uh, thousands of lives over there. This is truly a lesson learned for us. Thank you once again. And if I might say one more thing, it shouldn't have been on the list to start with uh, because it just got on there by chance somehow. Absolutely. And it is such a cruel twist of fate. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. I would now like to invite our next panelist, Barbara Newsom from Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons, Chicago. Barbara, you have the floor. Thank you, Kahekashan. It's just wonderful to be able to speak about Nagasaki and the importance of it. I was about five years old when I really became aware of the pain of Nagasaki. I have a different story to tell. I was looking at my father's photos that he brought back from the war. And I knew that my dad um, it couldn't talk about it because it was too painful. And as you can see, it's still painful even after 65 years for me to talk about what happened to people in Nagasaki. So I'm very honored to speak tonight for people to honor people of Nagasaki. I like to think of it past, present, and future. Now, how did I know these things? My father did talk about his service in the war. He was a Navy physician and in um, 1944 was assigned to the Pacific Fleet Marines, the Navy in the United States serves the Marine Corps. So the second Marine Division, right after the bomb was dropped in Nagasaki, were the ones to go ashore, not knowing what they would find. By this time in the war, I know my father had seen 
many, many atrocities. And some of those before he died, I, I learned about. But in my own case, when I was in graduate school myself, studying um, management and communications, I was asked to work on a research project for our own Department of Defense. And that project was to discuss, just to research and plan for nuclear weapons effects on the public, not on the military, but just what had happened with my father in Nagasaki, what he walked into for everyone. Um, no matter what had happened to them, he was there for nine months with other doctors. And I do want tonight to honor those doctors. Um, Dad didn't bring back very many things from the war, but he brought back the business cards of Japanese men that he worked with. Um, I could show those, but it takes a little time. But I do want to honor their families and their descendants. T. Kabata, H. Kishida, S. Sato, and the Mitsubishi family who made all of their workers and equipment available to the Second Marine Division and others who were helping and all the Japanese rescue workers. They worked together, as I understand it, and when I was growing up, that was one of the few things that my father really could talk about with great reverence and respect. Now, this is my 48th year of working in nuclear safety and security myself of all kinds. And I know that what my father would want to say today is first of all, I'm sorry. People cannot say that enough and forgiveness is essential. Secondly, he would want me to say thank you for so many people in Japan, especially the Habakasha, who are um, working for peace all the time. I want other people to be encouraged when they see this broadcast to speak up. This is my very first time, and you can see how hard it is. So that's what real courage is, is to speak the truth about this event. I know very well what Ambassador Graham shared because I've studied it, and I've studied every other safety and security issue in nuclear materials for the past 48 years myself. And so my father would want you to know, this story is not about history. It's about today, at this very moment, for two or three or four reasons, as you heard Ambassador Graham explain, there can be, first of all, human error. There can be technological failures, usually multiple. And believe me, in the history of nuclear materials, since 1949, since August 9, there have been so many of those. Please get to know the history of nuclear materials. My greatest concern, and most of the people who work professionally in this field, is an accident right now, the way that nuclear materials have expanded all over the world in every nation. They're right down your street in your Department of Nuclear Medicine at a local hospital. This is not the past. That's why I say past, present, and future. Now, good news, and this is mainly what I want to share. My father was a man of peace before he went to war. He thinks that's one reason he might have been assigned to the Fleet Marines rather than another hospital. But he really became a man of peace in his faith. And I know that's how he made it through. After all these years, I've wondered how did dad even keep his composure treating people in these terrible, horrific conditions for so many years? And he didn't stop there. He also volunteered for the Korean conflict to do the same thing as a medical doctor to help people. So I finally figured out that my father made choices. He made choices as a man of faith. And when he treated someone, no matter how bad the conditions, to them, he was a soul, he was a spirit. The body, the human body cannot be harmed. I mean, the, the body can be harmed, but the spirit cannot. And I think that's what kept my dad going all those years. And oh, about mid-career, I said to dad, do you wanna go back to Japan? And he said, well, I don't think it would really be worth it to make a trip because by that time he had lost his eyesight from his high radiation exposure in Nagasaki. 
And some years later, I said, well, if we can't go, just tell me the stories about it. And all of them had to do with peace and the need for peace and never, ever to use nuclear weapons again. We must find a better way. So for my dad, who died at almost age 93 and never had a health issue in his life, only one, went to the hospital for a somewhat minor issue and was hospitalized when they discovered he wouldn't be able to make it because he had developed leukemia, which is also a long-term effect of radiation. So I'm not the only family. There are many like me whose, whose parents served and, and whose children grew up with concerns and issues. We call it trauma. And that was my dad's specialty. He worked with people to heal from trauma. So I learned a lot from my father about that side of war. And what my dad would say is to keep going. <laughs> Today, I think, in telling my story, it's somewhat closure for my father because I'm retired now <laughs> and this is my project. And I think dad's really happy about that. And I, I want to honor the descendants of all the Japanese that he served with because I know they're carrying on as well. The Habakasha have done it from Nagasaki and now Nagasaki is not going away. It's going to be part of the peace story today and tomorrow and the next day. And on my mainland where I wanna make sure we have museums of the quality that you have in Japan to really help people understand why we work for peace and that it can be done. Now, I can assure you, it's never been a technological problem. It's simply a matter of the will of the people of the world. And we hope you will join us in this work. And that I would say <laughs> is because we need new thinking. We need new approaches. It's been 75 years. We've come close to so many accidental detonations so many times. Read about Abel Archer. What I want you to know about that is the importance of prayer and spirituality. That was 1983. It's a code name for a Russian United States conflict. People in the spiritual communities of our world, the faith communities of our world, could not know that it was happening because it was top secret, but they did know and prayed for it because they were in tune with the spiritual real needs of our planet, the real spirituality of our planet. So I joined Voices for a Nuclear Weapons Free World because it is an interfaith movement, and I believe that's what it takes. And that means there's a sunrise. This is my, my Nagasaki sunrise. You know, the sunset really bothered people in Nagasaki. This is a sunrise that I took myself on the East Atlantic coast. There's a Navy submarine base to the north. This is in Florida, in Kings Bay. And there's a naval base to the south in Jacksonville, Florida. But this morning, when I like to meditate and pray at sunrise, I saw the contrails of jet fighter planes on exercise. And I took the photo because it reminds me of my prayer for peace, that working together, we will have a world, a new world with new thinking about how to solve this problem where power is measured by the safety and security of all people living abundantly a future in which airplanes and rockets will fly only for peace. Peace be with you. Thank you so much, Barbara, for sharing with us your father's story as a Navy physician in Nagasaki. And it's in your story, it's truly moving. And another lesson for us today on why we should move towards nuclear disarmament, as well as the critical importance of finding that humanity within ourselves. Thank you once again. I would now like to invite our next panelist, John Raymer, who is the co-founder of Spine Network and Alliance. John, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, truth is, I wish we'd never have to be here for this. But what a mess we made. And my father came to understand he played an important part in that. And that haunted him for his entire life. Um, so my name is John Raymer. I'm the youngest son of First Lieutenant Robert Raymer, mm -hmm. a pilot of the B-29 Super Fortress that was known as the Little Gem. Uh, my father went to war 
after Pearl Harbor, he, uh, he came out of the Great Depression and the war changed my father's life. They were so poor. He remember, I remember him telling me that it was the first time ever he could get seconds at a meal. And the army was like a, a new, very positive experience for him at that time. He was decorated for the number of successful missions that he piloted. He was, uh, by all measures, considered a hero. The only problem is, is that war is insane. My father came to see that, and he regretted greatly his part. Uh, when you're so many feet above and you're dropping these bombs, you really are clueless. And he did not realize until later in his life the toll. You know, there were these Baka bombs and kamikaze pilots, people that were willing to give their lives to kill other people. It's crazy what was going on then. What were we thinking? How come we were not talking? So what happened was he was on this secret mission and he was in the air when they dropped the atomic bomb. He was dropping leaflets on Nagasaki and uh, telling them that they had just dropped the atomic bomb and that they should surrender. And I remember my father uh, realizing that he was no better than the people at the Nuremberg trials who when asked, why did you do what they did? The, the best answer he could have was I was following orders. We need to reorder our world. And to my father's credit, he came to know that and that haunted him. And I don't know what it's gonna take for us to get how serious this is. I talked to Jonathan the other day. He talked to me about strategically how nuclear weapons are being brought into the battlefields and we're going in the wrong direction. So I'm grateful for the chance to be here to help build this fire of love and compassion that wakes up to realize that this idea that we could be treating each other like this in such adversarial polarizing and conflicting ways is just wrong and needs to stop. So thank you for letting me share my dad's story and thank you for everybody for what you're doing. Thank you so much, John, for sharing your father's story. And you're right. It's so sad that we are having this discussion today because Nagasaki, the use of nuclear weapons shouldn't have happened in the first place. But unfortunately, we are here today and it's up to us to make sure that something like that never, ever happens again. So thank you once again for being here and sharing your story. I would now like to invite our final panelist, Louisa Hext from Charter for Compassion who will share with us the story of Sachiko Yasui, who is a survivor of the Nagasaki bombing. Luisa, you have the floor. Thank you so much. And it is such an honor, it's such a privilege to be here this evening, speaking on behalf of two incredible women that came together to be able to share the story of Sachiko. And I'm gonna do my best to share the screen with you because that will be much more powerful than looking at me as I share this incredible story. I have some photographs to share with you. And hopefully I can share the screen and we will continue. Not a pro, but here we go. So as you see, uh, Sachiko, to the left and Karen Stelson to the right. A little about Karen Stelson, author of Sachiko. During World War II, Karen's father fought against the Nazis in Germany. Her dad never shared his war stories with her and she didn't ask. She wondered, how do you live through war? As a teenager, she read Anne Frank's diary, and as an adult, she interviewed survivors of war. She wondered, after war, how do you find peace? In 2005, Karen heard Sachiko Yusawi tell her story of surviving the atomic bombing of Nagasaki. Uh, Luisa, I'm sorry to interrupt. We cannot see the picture. Oh, 
I'm not sure. Um, you open, open the picture. It is open, so I'm not sure that it's going to work. Yeah, uh, when because you share, uh, Louisa, you should share your desktop because you you shared a different screen. It's only showing one That's screen. Here. There you are. Now, when you open another picture, it should show that other picture too. Yeah. Oh, are you not seeing a picture right now? We, we are. We are. Yeah. We're seeing one. Yeah, I, I, it must have been a glitch because that's exactly what I did the first time. Thank you, John. So there, to the left is uh, such a code. To the right is Karen. In two thousand five, Karen heard such a code. You saw we tell her story of surviving the atomic bombing of Nagasaki. What she said haunted Karen and she wanted to know more. Karen met Sachiko Yosawi at the Lindale Park Peace Garden in Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's where I live and that park and the Peace Garden is absolutely beautiful. There she heard Sachiko tell her story of surviving the atomic bombing of Nagasaki. Five years later, she wrote a letter to Sachiko and proposed that they work on a book together about her experience and she agreed. In November 2010, Karen made her first trip to Nagasaki with interpreter Dr. Takiyaki Miyanishi. She traveled to Nagasaki five times to gather her story. Sachiko, a Nagasaki bomb survivor story was published in 2016 This is why I wish somebody could manage my screen for me. Are you seeing the picture of the book? Yes. Beautiful. A Bowl Full of Peace was released this week, which is a children's version of a similar story. Sachiko, a Nagasaki bomb survivor story, is targeted as teenagers, but from my experience, it's an absolutely beautiful book that tells us the history of Nagasaki, such as the ambassador shared with us, and also a survivor's story. And I'd like to read you a little bit uh, from the book that describes the story just a little bit. August 9th, 1945 began like any day for six-year-old Sachiko. A country was at war, and she didn't have enough to eat. At 11.01 a.m., she was playing outdoors with four other children. Moments later, those children were dead. An atomic bomb had exploded half a mile away. In the days and months that followed, Sachiko lost family members. Her hair fell out. She woke screaming at night. When she was finally well enough to start school, other children bullied her. Through it all, she sought to understand what had happened, finding strength in the writings of Helen Keller, Gandhi, and Martin Luther King Jr. The book is based on extensive interviews with Sachiko Yusawi, and Karen shows the story of a young girl who survived the atomic bomb and chronicles her long journey to find peace. Sachiko's stories offers readers a remarkable new perspective on the final moments of World War II and their aftermath. In the fall of 2013, Sachiko experienced a stroke. Karen visited her in January 2014 and remains in close contact with her. Sachiko currently receives care in a nursing home in Nagasaki. I have a couple of thoughts that I'd like to share with you that relates to what Nagasaki has shared and the story that Sachiko wishes for us to be consider. One of the most important messages that she's shared in my conversations with Karen is whatever happened to me must never happen to you. And that is quite clearly described from the other panelists within the context of our conversation. Additionally, when asked, what would you like young people to know 
in this world? She shares two questions. Those questions are, what is peace? And what kind of person should I be? Keep pursuing answers to these questions, she said. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for sharing that story with us today, Luisa. And yes, I think we all need to ask ourselves what kind of person do we want to be and our conscience will give us the answer and that will prompt us to uh, go out there and make a positive change. And uh, thank you to all our panelists for teaching us so many important lessons from Nagasaki. We cannot undo the events of 9th August 1945, but we can at the very least pledge not to allow such an atrocity to be perpetrated on humankind again. We shall now move on to our next segment, Lessons into Actions Youth Voices. Young people play a crucial role in ensuring that our generation and the future generations know about the destruction caused by nuclear weapons and take informed decisions to make this planet a more peaceful place to live in. So I shall now pass on the floor to our youth. Sarah, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Kirkishan, and greetings of peace to all of you. It's beautiful to be sharing the space and all the moving stories that, that have been shared so far and to follow that amazing question of what is peace, particularly for, for young people. So thank you, Louisa, for sharing that. I'm Sarah Oliver, and I'm the Global Youth Coordinator of the United Religions Initiative. And it's an honor to share with you the vision of peace held by the youth members of Voices for a World Free of Nuclear, of nuclear Weapons. We'd like to share with you the well-known story of Sadako Sasaki and the 1,000 Peace Cranes as inspiration for action. I'll, I'll add that I'm speaking to you from Cape Town, South Africa, a country that created its own nuclear weapons in the 1980s and voluntarily disarmed them in the 1990s under the leadership of Nelson Mandela and has since gone on to sign the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And so on this 75th anniversary, as we commemorate the lessons of Nagasaki, let us focus on what it is that, that brings us hope and hold on relentlessly to our wish for peace. In the wake of the nuclear devastation in Japan all those years ago, it was the story of a young Japanese girl that came to embody this wish for peace. The story was told to the International Criminal Court in 1995 by the mayor of Hiroshima, Mr. Takashi Hiroka, and has since been told thousands of times over. Sadako Sasaki was exposed to the bomb at the age of two. She appeared to grow up strong and healthy, but 10 years later in 1955, she was suddenly diagnosed with leukemia and hospitalized. Inspired by the Japanese legend that folding a thousand cranes would make a wish come true, Sadako spent her days in hospital folding paper cranes, using any paper she could find, including the paper her medicine came in. Unfortunately, the illness was too strong and Sadako passed away at the young age of 12. But her story and the image of the cranes, one that I have here, has become a symbol of healing and peace around the world. Her legacy of struggle and hope for tomorrow informs the important work we must do if we want to see a future free of nuclear weapons. I'd like to share the words of Skylar Oberst, who is a, another young leader from Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but he wrote the following words as a call to action. Today, as we, the youth of the world, honor the past, let us reflect on the legacy and lessons of this difficult time. Let us carry on this work and remember that we can, through our meaningful actions, change the world. We must call on our leaders and implore them to remember what we know, that we must act and rid the world of nuclear weapons for our species to survive. If we want to enjoy the same blessings as our elders, we must ensure that our future is secure. 
We must ensure that our children's future is secure. We must demand our future be secured and we must act together. In an age of social distancing, we must remember never to be spiritually distant. We invite you to join us in this work. Those were the words of Skylar Oberst. I'll now hand over to my friend and colleague, Isaac Thomas, to share more about the campaign and vision for peace that we hold as young people. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing the wonderful story of the Peace Cranes. Greetings to everyone. My name is Isaac S. Thomas. I am one of the Global Council Trustees for URI and the founder of Global Youth Movement CC. As we discussed, the need of the hour is disarmament and the complete abolishment of nuclear weapons. For the past 75 years, the nuclear stockpile has decreased from a high of 70,000 active weapons to less than 14,000 total nuclear warheads in the world. Our aim is to get this to zero. Our generation faces a special responsibility because the march of modern technology has made ever more deadly the weapons of war. We are most keenly aware of that in the case of nuclear weapons because of the terrifying destructive power which the past generation has witnessed and which none of us can ever forget. The world cannot cancel the knowledge of how to make them. It is an irreversible fact. But however, we can ensure that no more testing or manufacturing of nuclear weapons is done in the future. So how can we stand up and raise a global voice against this? There is something meaningful to our world today when I think about Sadako's origami. All of us can make a difference and all of us have the potential to change the world into something beautiful. Perhaps Sadako's greatest legacy is the reminder that we all can rid the world of nuclear weapons through our simple and thoughtful actions. This is why we are launching the social media campaign, which we will show you now. We call on you to remember Sadako's story. Using recycled paper found in your home, fold a paper crane and another and another. Folding a paper crane takes a bit of practice, but it is fun. There are wonderful resources that offer great tips and how-to videos to get you started. We invite you to fold paper cranes and send them to your elected representatives at the local, provincial, and national level. Speaking to you from India, a nuclear state that recently joined the nuclear triad, I encourage you to speak up and demand that your government support all treaties to limit and ban nuclear weapons. Share with them the importance of Nagasaki's lessons. Take your time to sign the change.org petition calling for reversing the race of mutually assured destruction. We call on you to send the peace cranes to your community leaders, faith leaders, and loved ones to remind them of how much you care and how important this legacy for change truly is. We call on you to share your work on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter using the hashtags Voices Youth, Save Tomorrows, and Cranes for Peace, and tag Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons. Express your solidarity by taking a new profile picture for social media, holding your folded cream. Challenge others to do it and even share videos so that they can follow your example on taking action. By helping share these stories, we begin to show the world how committed we are to a better and brighter tomorrow. Through the simple act of folding a crane, we remember the stories of those who came before us we will appreciate the stillness of the present. We are resolved to see the wish of a nuclear free world realized. The links for all the above social media campaigns will be posted in the chat and will be available in our Facebook pages, websites, and via Google slide. This is an initiative of youth passionate about the disarmament of nuclear weapons and its complete abolishment. We have a wonderful team of young peace multipliers like Kirkashan, Skyler, Sarah, Vincent, and many others who share the dream of a world free of nuclear weapons. Let this be the beginning of a global voice, the beginning of new collaborations, the beginning of real change. May God bless us all and may peace prevail on Mother Earth. Thank you. Thank you so much to our young people for 
uh, talking to us about such an important issue. And thank you for showing us how we can take our quest for nuclear disarmament forward. Our next and final segment is the interfaith prayers, blessings, and calls to action from people who have dedicated their lives to peace and disarmament. So I would like to welcome today Monica Willard, the Right Reverend William Swing, Swamini Adityananda Saraswati, Johnson Granoff, Vincent Leong, and Dot Maver. I shall now pass the floor to Monica. The floor is yours. I just am humbled by hearing the wonderful stories, the calls to action, and I am so excited that we are here to pray for the end of nuclear weapons, to free this world from nuclear weapons. I'm sharing a short indigenous prayer from grandfather Harry Bird, and I learned it at the prayer vigil for the earth. So I envision those that who know what the Washington Monument looks like, and the fact that it the mall would face the White House. A ring of teepees were planted there for a weekend every year for 13 years. And at the prayer vigil for the earth, the call was a heartfelt prayer is more powerful than an atom bomb. I call on all of you, not only those who follow me live on this video, but all of us in our hearts to pray for a world free of nuclear weapons. My name is William Swing and I uh, coordinate Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons. And for the last eight years, Every month we get together and every month we say the same prayer. And this is our nuclear prayer. Let us pray. The beginning and the end are in your hands, O creator of the universe. And in our hands, you have placed the fate of this planet. We who are tested by having both creative and destructive power in our free world, turn to you in sober fear and in intoxicating hope. We ask for your guidance and to share in your imagination in our deliberations about the use of nuclear force. Help us to lift the fog of atomic darkness that hovers so pervasively over our earth, your earth, so that soon all eyes may see life magnified by your pure light. Bless all of us who wait today for your presence and who dedicate ourselves to achieve your intended peace and rightful equilibrium on the earth. In the name of all that is holy and all that is hoped. Amen. Swamini. Yes, I'm Swamini Adityananda Saraswati. Um, there is a plague on this earth that is much worse than COVID that has stricken us and needs to be removed from our planet if we are to have a peaceful world where future generations are guaranteed survival. That plague is called It's Okayism. It's Okayism. What does that mean? It means every time we say, it's okay, that's a faraway land. It's okay, we need more weapons because we need to protect and we need to uh, have a way to fight war. We spread disease. We spread the disease of pain. There's another disease called, it's just themism. When we see another, and we see them as something other than our sisters and brothers. 
we cause pain. The people of Japan were seen by the people of another nation as not human. And I tell you this, that there are other nations who see other nations as not human and so forth and so on. And so has history gone. But the fact of the matter is we are all human. We all bleed red. We all have hearts that beat for one another. We all have loved ones that want to see us come home. And when we're up above the clouds, we may not see those souls. We may not, may not see those children. We may not see the mothers who love them, but know they're there. When we talk about war, know those children are there. When weapons escalate, know the Oso, that accidents can happen just like happened in Beirut not so long ago. We have been given a sacred gift, which is the gift of choice. What are we going to do with our lives? What are we going to do with this world? Humanity, with the touch of a finger, can destroy this entire planet. And with the touch of a pen, can start making change. With the sound of our voices, hearts beating as one, hands come together. We can make that difference, but it's up to each and every one of us to raise our voices, to hold each other's hands and say, no, we want a world, a world without war. We want to do away with the nightmare that is the nuclear menace. Let us pray this together. Let us hold this in our hearts together and let us remember forever. We are family. This world, this world is our one home and each one of us are brothers and sisters of hearts. I bow to you all. Hello. Uh, yes. Am, am I live here? Yes. Okay. My beloved brothers and sisters, uh, my name is Jonathan Granoff. I serve as the president of the Global Security Institute, and I'm the ambassador for peace, security, and nuclear disarmament of the Parliament of the World's Religions. And I'm the ambassador to the United Nations of the World Summit of Nobel Peace Laureates. This is my humble prayer that Nagasaki be the last use of a nuclear weapon ever. That nuclear weapons never be used again. Oh God, bless and guide us. To eliminate these devices, the apex of creative evil and all devices of massive indiscriminate death, please guide us. Each of us came into this world responding to our mother's embrace and love. Each of us came seeking family and love. Each of us became identified with nation, race, gender, religion, and forgot we are one human family and every person is as precious as we are. But still, in the stillness, in every heart remains a light of the soul seeking, resonating, and longing for that love that brought us here into this world. That love awakens and informs our universal humanity and can awaken hearts without borders the hearts that we need to have. Intelligence has given us insights into the wondrous secrets of matter, energy, and space and time itself. But fear, ignorance, arrogance, pride, hatred, and differences have led us to use these insights to create devices of incomprehensible power to inflict indescribable, horrific suffering. Please, dear Lord of all, creator of every life, every heartbeat, every moment, every leaf, blade of grass, every one of us, and universes and galaxies beyond counting. O oh, glorious source of love and life, forgive us for forgetting you and your blessings. 
O friend within all friendships, love within all loves, life within all lives, witness of all and everything. Bless us with the wisdom that comes from compassion, such that we will skillfully eliminate these devices of death and use the gift of intelligence to serve, to heal, to sustain, to harmonize, to understand and glorify you, our humanity, and honor your creation. To end the suffering of poverty, to protect nature, to love one another, remove the ignorance from our hearts. Grant us hearts of gratitude, courage, determination, and love, such that we will not falter in bringing alive peace, justice, beauty, and unity to your human family. Help us eliminate these devices of death and the motives from which they come. Please guide us in beautiful ways of peace such that we can become witnesses for your goodness. Guide us with compassion, kindness, that we might become fully human. All praises are yours, O oh God. All of this belongs to you. May we become fully human and evidence your love. Amen. Hi, my name is Winston. I'm from Malaysia. So as a fellow youth from Global UCC and a new youth member of the Voices of Free of Nuclear Weapon, today I'll be sharing with you some of the things which I have been having in my mind for throughout my years of um, engagement in terms of uh, for eliminating the nuclear weapon in the face of the earth. In fact, today marks a very special event where people of different generations, different religious backgrounds, coming together towards a common goal, and it is the aim to eliminate nuclear weapon from the face of this universe. In fact, this week itself, we have three new countries which have ratified the TPNW, making us another step closer to the realization of a world free of nuclear weapon. Another significance, this year also marks the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it has been always, or it has been many years that we have been doing what we can to realize the idea of eliminating nuclear weapons. For long, we have talked, planned, garnered support, but we have come to a point that we should have asked ourselves, when is this gonna end? When is this gonna come into realization? Bioweapons, chemical weapons, they were banned immediately when consequences were seen. But the question is, if they have been banned, why can't we do the same for nuclear weapon? This week itself, we have seen unexpected explosion happening in different parts of the world. To me, it is not only a sign, but it is actually an awakening, a realization that the risk exists. No one will know when there's going to be a nuclear weapon explosion. But when we do, it will probably be too late for us. Because after all, the things that we treasure in our life they will no longer be in front of us. We no longer have any excuse as we live in an interconnected world, a world filled with limitless potential, will a world full of resourceful. It is time that we stand up and write a new chapter into the histories of our future generation. As a fellow generation who did not have any first-hand experience in the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I too feel the despair and the dangers of nuclear weapon. If an added ordinary youth like me can speak here today to share my deepest concern, then there is no longer any more excuse for us not to take the next leap. So I would like to encourage everyone here today to join us together, not only to take simple actions that we can take in our own responsibility as well as our own action, but let's all join hands together, solidarity in eliminating nuclear weapon from the face of the earth. Thank you. Dot Maver with Global Silent Minute. The power of silence is greater than we know. Today, the 75th anniversary of the day the bomb fell on Nagasaki. 
we will take a sacred minute of silent unity for healing and peace, for a world free of nuclear weapons. We take a deep breath as we imagine healing and peace activated within our own hearts. And we link our hearts across distance. Now we take another moment and we invite all those on the other side of the veil to assist with our intention for healing and peace in the world. Let us now join together in sacred silence as action May peace prevail on earth. Thank you to everyone for such deep reflections, which are so needed in today's world. We have indeed learned several lessons from Nagasaki today. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we would request you to stay on and watch the 75th Commemorative Remembrance of Hiroshima and Nagasaki online presentation created by four of the world's largest interfaith organizations, the United Religions Initiative, Parliament of the World's Religions, Charter for Compassion, and Religions for Peace. I've posted the links uh, to its Facebook and YouTube pages on the chat. I would like to conclude by saying that while Hiroshima is often at the forefront of disarmament discussions, as it was the first time a nuclear weapon was used in warfare, Nagasaki is equally important because we want that to be the last time that a nuclear weapon is ever used. On that note, thank you for being with us today. Please stay safe and let us ask ourselves the question, how many more years do we have to wait to see a world free of nuclear weapons? Thank you so much and goodbye.